rising like the sun Make a way for the King of Heaven He has come to meet with us Make a way for the King of Heaven He is riding on the cloud Good morning, Vineyard Church. I am so glad to see every one of you. Thank you for being here and sharing your Sunday morning with us. My name is Tammy, if I haven't met you, and we're so, so glad to have you here. Would you stand with us as we open our service with song? Make way for the King of Heaven, He is rising like the sun. Make way for the King of Heaven, He has come to meet with us. Make way for the King of Heaven, He is riding on the cloud. Make way for the King of Heaven, He's coming for us now. And holy, holy, the one who is, holy, holy, the one who's come, holy, holy, the one who's coming back again. Make way for the King of Heaven, He's coming for His bride. Make way for the King of Heaven, He is making all things right. Make way for the King of Heaven, there is healing. Make way for the King of Heaven, for His kingdom and His reign. And we sing, Holy, Holy, the One who is. Holy, Holy, the One who's come. Holy, Holy, the One who's coming back again. Again. He's coming back again. Rise up, rise up. It's the song of heaven. Rise up, rise up. Join the song of heaven. Rise up, rise up. It's the song of heaven, rise up, rise up, and join the song of heaven, rise up, rise up. It's the song of heaven, rise up, rise up, join the song of heaven, rise up, rise up. It's the song of heaven, rise up, rise up. We join, we join, holy, holy.
back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. Amen. Take a moment, take a minute, and greet someone near you, or maybe that you haven't had a chance to say good morning to yet. And hmm, what should we ask today? Uh, fall or spring, which is your favorite? Uh, to those in the room, a welcome to our friends joining us online. If you are joining us online for the first time, I just posted a link for you to take your first step to get connected. If you're checking us out for the first time here in the room, you can do the same thing. If this is your first time checking us out, we would love to help get you connected when you're ready to take that step. One of the things that we love to do to celebrate our value for generosity is when you fill out a Connect card for the first time, that will initiate that we will make a $5 donation on your behalf to one of our local charity partners. We work with Dream Center Peoria and Southside Mission, who are both doing great work on the front lines, combating things like homelessness, poverty, and hunger. And so if you would take 30 seconds right now, you can do the paper card on the chair back in front of you. You can scan the QR code, or again, online, you can just click the link. And that'll trigger, you'll get an email reply uh, where you can let us know which way you'd like to direct that small donation. And we'll add that to our regular monthly support uh, that we do with those important organizations. All right, well, we are glad that you're spending your weekend here with us. Uh, I'm glad to be with you. My name's Matthew. If I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the lead pastors here. And I want to let you know about a couple of things real quick that are going on this week at Vineyard. Uh, we have youth group meeting tonight, so if you have a student in 6th to 12th grade, that gathering happens tonight at 6.30. They usually meet on the first and third Sundays, so you can be aware of that and get involved. Uh, if you signed up, registration is now closed, but if you signed up for Serve the City, that's coming this Saturday. Um, just to put it on your radar, if you didn't get a chance to sign up, they do this twice a year, so there'll be another opportunity in the spring, but our partner, Dream Center Peoria, organizes a citywide day of service. And so there's all sorts of different projects that happen like all over town at other nonprofits, at churches, at just places in the city. And they just invite everyone to come be a part. So we have a small team that's going to serve. And that's this Saturday from 8 to noon. Um, and again, there'll be another opportunity for that in the spring. And then I also wanted to mention we still have two more weeks that we're collecting donations for facial tissues and disinfectant wipes for the Heights grade school. Um, we were able to do our first drop. Uh, we took them, I, I didn't, don't remember the exact count, but it was somewhere around 50-ish uh, of each item for the initial drop to help provide, especially for the first drop, we focused on, uh, there were a number of special education teachers and, and classrooms that, that literally don't have, like their students don't bring anything. And so we were able to help provide them. That's just a really simple thing. But we were told by teachers uh, that it's a common item. They end up dipping into their own pocket to resource their classroom. So thank you for your generosity. Uh, keep bringing those in. We've got the orange buckets out in the foyer for the next two weeks um, to help us stock some of the other classrooms for this fall. All right. Uh, last couple things I want to mention, and then I'm going to wrap up our new sermon series. 
Um, we have a few different other ways that you can get connected. And so if you're here in the room and you're thinking about, or maybe later in the service, you feel God stirring something in you, I really want to take the next step. We, we love that language around here. We believe we're all on a journey with Jesus. And wherever you're at on that journey, you have a next step. And your next step might be different than mine, but we want to be the kind of community where we're, we're helping uh, encourage people and resource people to take your next step. So if at any point in time during the service today or even during the week, uh, you want to investigate something like that, like uh, b water baptisms, which we're going to celebrate a little bit later, um, that and many other steps can be found at vineyardpeoria.org slash next steps. And there's, a, there's five or six things listed there. You can click on those. You can learn more. You can fill out an interest form, and that'll initiate contact where we can follow up with you and help you on whatever your step is. One of the most common for those of us that consider this our home that are around here regularly is financial support. And so if you uh, are a person who gives financial support, we thank you for your generosity. If you're considering giving or want to know how to give, you can learn more about that online as well, vineyardpeoria.org slash give. Super simple. I know, I get, I, get, I get excited and I'm not even to the message yet, so I'm going I'm to slow my pace down. And why don't, why don't we just do that? One of the things I like to do, uh, especially in a service like this, there's already a level of anticipation and things is, I think it's okay, let's just slow down. I'm, I'm, I'm with you in that. Let's, let's slow down. And let's actually just invite God. Uh, he's here. He's already with us. But let's just, sometimes we don't, we don't hear him or sense him just because we haven't stopped to slow down and listen. So I'd love to just start today by taking a moment to just invite God uh, to have his way, to be with us, but also just to help us slow down and, and be present with him. So would you just join me as we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that we can gather here. I thank you for your peace that is available. I thank you, Jesus, that you live in us, who are your followers, and that you are like that constant live in health, that you're always there, that you're always ready. And we're asking right now that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to be present in this moment, to receive everything that you have, to hear what you're saying, to do what you're doing. And Jesus, we're literally asking, wherever we're at on that spiritual journey, would you help us take that next step? And would you transform us to be more like you? We thank you because we know that you're a good God and that you answer prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now I want to take you on a little bit of an imaginative uh, experiment here for just a moment. Now, I know this might be kind of cruel to do at this time of morning because some of us might already be thinking about lunch. But I want you to dial up in your mind one of your favorite meals. Get a picture, start thinking about how you would how you would describe it, what 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 kind of seasonings it might have, how you might like it cooked. I, I'm 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 kind of an old school, grew up on a farm, kind of a meat and potatoes kind of guy. So for me it, it might be very simple. It might be a a nice, juicy New York strip steak screaming hot grill, nice sear, a little bit of garlic herb butter, maybe some fried potatoes and onions and some cucumber and tomato vinegar salad. You know, I can I can I can build this picture out pretty easy, right? And some of you are like, yeah, I, I could adopt that one. That doesn't sound too bad. When you go to a restaurant, uh, now, some restaurants, it's just like, you know, and I'm not against fast food, but I'm illustrating a point here. You know, yeah, I went to number four. You know, it's like it's very basic. There's not a lot of descriptive. But at a nicer restaurant, you might pick up the menu and you might read a, a very descriptive uh, description of some of the items on the menu. They might use lots of adjectives or maybe even some French words that you don't know. But they're trying to paint a picture like we just did of what it is that you're, that you're wanting to have, what you're wanting to taste of. Well, I, I want to begin to take us into where we're going today and talking about the word 
by, by making this statement that works in this example, but you're going to see how it applies to the message here in a minute. When you're thinking about those things, the menu is not the meal. The menu is not the meal, meaning no matter how much that thing might inspire you, might kind of make your, I mean, I have a little bit, you know, like mouth is almost watering thinking about that, that nice seared New York strip steak, right? But I can't eat the menu. I can't eat the idea of it or the picture, but that helps me decide what I want to taste of, what I want to actually have. Well, in a book that I read, which quoted another guy, it's kind of a third-hand reference, but they talk about this idea of the menu isn't the meal, and that's one of the ways that we're going to begin to look at the Word of God today. Uh, I, another quick, I, I just I love to make book recommendations if you want to dive into this more. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the Message Bible, has a great book called Eat This Book, and it's all about the Bible. And, and that's kind of the idea is that when we start thinking about the Word, because that's what today's topic has been, we've been in this four-week series about the power of His presence. We've been talking about kingdom moments, uh, life-changing moments in the kingdom of God. And we've talked about water baptism. We've talked about the demonstration of the kingdom in communion. We've talked about worship last week. And this week, we're talking about the Word. But I want to start from this place that when it comes to the Word, it is to stir up our hunger. It is to stir up our thirst of what we're going to taste of in the person of Jesus. The menu is not the meal. It's really important. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know if you've been around this church for a while, we are Word people. We're also Spirit people. And the two are not mutually exclusive. So I have a really high value for the Word but the purpose of the word is to get me to Jesus, to point me towards him, to describe things about him that make me want to actually see and taste that the Lord is good. All right? So you can uh, kind of follow along that line of thought. Let's dive in and look at the power of his presence in the word. Now, I want to give you a quick definition also. As we've been thinking about this whole series, and these different uh, moments or points where we sort of intersect and experience things that uh, are connected to our relationship with God, a lot of this also has to do with that journey, that Jesus journey, or that, to use more uh, churchy language just for a moment, the process of spiritual maturity, right? So you've heard me probably say this a million times, our walk with Jesus is not like a game of Monopoly where you try to get the get-out-of-jail-free card and then you stick that in your pocket and hold on to it till you die just so you can make sure you get through the pearly gates. I'm sorry, it's just that it's, that's not it. There is a reality to being a follower of Jesus means that my life now here on this earth is different than it was before Jesus. And on that journey, on that process, I, to, to, to take that idea of maturity, and I think we, we have an understanding of what that means to mature, but in the biblical context, that means to become more like Jesus. It's not just make sure you're saved from the final things at the end and then just float or hide or hang on until you get to the end. No, we want to actually be in a process, in a relationship, relationships, grow, right? If you have a relationship with a, a spouse, a significant other, a parent, a good friend, like it's like a plant. You have to water it, you have to nurture it, but you hope that it grows. And over time, we want our relationship with Jesus to grow. But the cool thing about a relationship with Jesus is that as the relationship grows, we grow in that we become more like Jesus in that process. And we're going to look at this quick definition and then begin to unpack how the word is involved with this. A mature Christian is one that has developed habits of righteousness in their relationship with God, self, and others. Now, I'd love to point you to a, a book by Kevin Springer and John Wimber called PowerPoint. 
Uh, we've referenced this a few times through the series, but this definition comes from that book. And so if you want to unpack more that's behind that, there's some great stuff on what does it mean to have habits of righteousness. We, we've said before that righteousness in the biblical context is being right with God, which is a gift that only he can give. It's not something that we earn. We don't check boxes by our behavior or do certain things to like curry God's favor. He gives it to us as a gift. And habits of righteousness are the things that we do in our development process of walking out life with God that help us in that transformation process. See, it's not about the activities themselves. When I tell you, you know, it's a good idea to read your Bible. Well, we would probably all agree with that, right? But why? It's not about just memorization or attaining knowledge. It's that when you read the Bible, when you read what God has said, and as we'll get to a little bit later, what he is saying, that reality helps transform you. One of the things that, that and this is, it's a little tricky, but Sometimes when we approach the Bible as the thing we need to do, we need to realize that one of the things that reading God's Word does is sometimes it actually reads us. Like, how many times have you read something and all of a sudden you're aware of something? Or you realize how you've, like, walked out of alignment with, with God's reality? Like, th that th the, the Word of God is is alive it's living it's real and so in that process it's not often as much about us reading it as letting it read us because god wants to transform us he wants to change us and we have to be open and honest and willing to allow him to make those changes all right so we're gonna we're gonna establish a couple of things that are I don't want to say obvious, but I don't think they're going to be difficult to agree with, all right? So we're going to start with this fact that the Bible says that Jesus is the Word. So, so when we're talking about the power of His presence in the Word, we are not talking exclusively about the written text of the Bible. We're talking about Jesus is the Word, because that's what we read here. We go to John 1.1, 1, 1 and, and with these next few passages, like there's tons more you could read in John if you want to go further, but I'm just going to touch the highlights. John 1.1 1, 1 is sort of the epilogue to this chapter. It says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, he's not just talking in circles. He's, he's trying to illustrate something. The Word is Jesus, and Jesus has existed for all time in that perfect, community fellowship of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we drop on down to verse 14, it mentions this again. It says, the Word became human, and he made his home among us. Well, if you know the biblical narrative, that is an obvious reference to Jesus actually coming and being born of a virgin and walking out uh, 33 years of his life as a human person here on this earth. And, he, and so it, 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 what we're reading is that he's connecting those dots. Jesus is the word. One more place to reference real quick, John 14, 9. Jesus is talking to Philip, and he says, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. And so why are you asking me to show him to you? Again, Jesus is, is announcing clarifying like the father and i are one i am part of i he was god and he was part of the trinity and he's he's just trying to make that really clear all right so i think we accept that jesus is the word that's pretty commonly held in in christian circles the second thing that i want to begin to look at is that god speaks to us now this is where we go beyond just just reading because any, Bible included, any book, you can read it for the purpose of understanding what it says. And well, that's not a bad thing. It's probably good to understand. But it goes beyond that. We believe that God actually speaks to us. That he didn't, 
inspire the things that are written in the Bible and then say, all right, I'm done. I'll talk to you when you get here. No, he, if Jesus is the word, even though he's no longer physically here as a human being, he is an eternal being and he is not done speaking. He still speaks to his children. He still speaks in a number of different ways, which I don't have time to unpack and, and like teach all of that. That's like a whole thing on itself. How do we hear God? How do we, you know, <coughs> so we're not going to go there today, but just to establish God speaks to us. Let's look at Acts uh, chapter 18. We're just going to look at a couple verses, and then we're going to look at an Old Testament reference for how God speaks to us. Acts 18, this is 9 and 11, says, One nor what nor one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent. For I am with you, no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. Remember that phrase about the people that belong to him. So Paul stayed there for a year and a half teaching the word of God. Well, what do we see here? First of all, God, God spoke to him. In this instance, he spoke to him in a, in a vision. And he gave him encouragement, he gave him instructions, and he gave him a promise of being protected because he said, there's many people in this city that belong to me. And if I could just like paraphrase the implication here, he's saying, my people do my stuff. And so I'm going to put some of my people on the case to make sure that, that you're okay, that you're protected when you're doing what I say. Anytime God gives you instructions, he's going to give you the resources and the ability to do what he's asked you to do. And if it's something that people might oppose, I'm not saying there won't be opposition, but he's going to make it so that you can make it through, so that you can do the thing that he's asked you to do. But that all came from a word that God spoke to Paul in this vision. Uh, let's go all the way back to 1 Kings. We're going to go to 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 11. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. Now, I just have to pause, like, this is a crazy thing that we have just described, okay? I, I'm not going to unpack that. I'm just, I'm just going to say, I'm with you. It sounds a little weird. After the wind, there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. We, we could go read the story about Moses where he wasn't, you know, but we're not going there right now. After the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. In verse 13, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. See, God was speaking to him, but it wasn't necessarily in the way that he expected. Can we just be honest? Would it sometimes be easier if we could just go out on the front porch and ask God a question and the clouds would part sort of like in Monty Python and, and the big dude with the booming voice just comes out and says, you know, this is what I want you to do. I, I don't know. Would that be a little bit easier? But we see this oftentimes that he actually comes like a still small voice. It's a gentle whisper. And one of the reasons that I think that is, is because as followers of Jesus, we are meant, we are designed, we are called and invited to live in places of peace, places of rest. It doesn't mean we don't have battles that we fight, but like the default position for a Jesus person is peace and rest. And if you're at peace, if you're not at a level 10, you can usually hear a gentle whisper. Really, really simple example. If I'm sitting on the couch in the evening with my wife watching a show, as we often do, and the kids are in bed and asleep, but everything's quiet, and we, we live uh, on the East Bluff, and my nearest neighbor is like 100 yards away, uh, and surrounded by, like, it's a quiet place, unless a barge goes by and blows its horn, but for the most part. There has been multiple times where one of the kids will say something, and it's like, in that context, I'm sitting there quietly, I'm at peace, I'm at rest, I'm not running. 
I can hear them without, like they don't have to scream. I can hear them from the other room. As opposed to, you know, if I'm uh, out in the workshop running the saws and blaring the music, it's like, so I'm just, just think about our lives in that way. Jesus often comes as a still, small whisper because that's how we're meant to live. We're meant to live at peace. And here's the other thing. We already established and said God wants to speak to us, right? I might even take that a step further. More often than we realize he is, right? Like, he, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not, but God's a blabbermouth. He has a lot to say. He is speaking to us regularly. When we don't feel like we can hear God, it's not because he's being silent. It's just because we're not in a place where we're listening, where we're able to hear. And that's one of the things that, that the Word can help with. When we can slow down, when we can tune in to the Word of God, it will help quiet and still our souls in ways that we can hear the voice of God. And I don't know about you, but I need to hear it pretty regularly. Pretty regularly. All right. Uh, this is sort of a sub-point, but I just want to I mention this while we're on the topic. This process of learning to hear God's voice actually brings growth in our relationship with God. Now, that, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but the active, ongoing process of learning to hear God, and, and I'll say anytime God does speak, it calls for us to embrace Him, embrace what He's saying, and it typically calls for action. That could be on a number of different levels, but it's like he speaks to lead us, to guide us, to transform us. Like it's not just a passive thing, right? Now, I love to have casual conversations with God. Not everything is a thou shalt and a directive, but he speaks to, to transform us, to guide us, to move us along his path. And that process of learning how to hear him better actually brings growth in our relationship with him. All right? So now let's begin with that understanding of God speaking to us, of Jesus being the Word, and learning to hear His voice. Let's begin to get more practical about, well, how does the written Word uh, tie into that? Well, the first thing that I want to say, and again, if you've been a Christian very long at all, you probably have heard this or can agree with it. Scripture, meaning the written Word, is God breathed. Scripture is God breathed. Uh, we're going to read just a couple verses in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I want to just comment. This was written, this particular passage was written before, uh, like not all of the Bible was written. And it, and it was definitely before it was like fully organized and, and canonized, which is just the term meaning once the early church council sort of all agreed that, you know, we receive these 66 books that's like, this is the Bible as we know it today. Uh, okay, so this passage was, was written, uh, it's estimated probably 64, 65 A.D., something like that. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Again, that goes back to that it's reading us, right? Sometimes it brings correction. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And verse 17 says, God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. See, when, God, when God's word brings uh, conviction, which is just that awareness that I'm out of alignment, that I'm not in walking fully in uh, line with the relationship that I have, that I've been given freely, when, when we have that realization or that conviction, the Word of God can help bring correction. Well, here's what you should actually be focusing on. Here's what God is saying to you. Here's what you can do about it. And that actually equips us, or, or to use uh, some of my favorite terms, gives us the tools. Like you, we've all got a, a spiritual tool belt, and God uses Scripture to teach us, but also to give us tools that we can put in our tool belt and carry them with us and use 
to do every good work. We, as a body of people here, we're about good works. Not to gain God's favor, right? The good works that we do to serve people and to help people are all about for the benefit of those people. We're trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're trying to show Jesus' love because Jesus has called us to do that. He said, I'm going to go be with the Father. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. You continue my mission and ministry. And as we talked about uh, two weeks ago, it is an inexplicable part of Jesus' mission and ministry in the past and what continues now that ministry with and for uh, the poor and the needy, the least, the last, and the lost, it's just like it's part of the package. And so we're called to do that, but in order to be able to do that, we have to be more like Jesus. We have to begin to take on the characteristics of his heart. We have to begin to be equipped. How do I serve someone and practice mercy and not judgment? That, that's a real thing we have to learn. I'm still learning that. You're probably still learning that, but we're just recognizing that reality. We need to be equipped not only to just do good things so good things are done, but in the process, God continues to transform us. He continues to open our eyes, to make us more like him, to let us see what he sees. So all Scripture is God-breathed. Oh, there we go. So I want to stop here and just make a couple of, of really clear statements. One of the things we've been trying to do in this series is explore uh, these concepts, but also just kind of try to make some statements about uh, what we think is our best interpretation of the things that we're trying to follow. We, we want to be people that do what Jesus does, that follows his ways, and that we try to live a way of life that is described in the Bible, but it's the Jesus way of life. That's what we're trying to do. So we, as a, as a body, as a community, believe that the Bible, as we have it now, the 66 books, Old and New Testament, and this, as witnessed by the early church councils, is God's inspired and authoritative word. I just think it's like, that seems so basic, so elementary, but, you know, it's not universally accepted in our culture. And so we want to be people, and again, this is not mutually exclusive. Some people want to say there's word people and there's spirit people. And one of the things I love about the the tradition that we are a part of as the vineyard is that we have tried to say and walk out, we can be word and spirit. One of the things that I, I, I found so true, it really resonated with my spirit. Um, it was said early in our movement, it was one of those phrases that was just kind of coined and, and held on to. All word and no spirit, we dry up. All spirit and no word, we blow up. Word and spirit together, we can grow up. We can become mature. And, and I even have to press on that. Mature doesn't have to mean, excuse my language, old and crusty. Okay, right? Like, don't, don't let it take. Mature has to do with I've come into understanding. I've, I've, gained, a, I've gained a little bit of understanding, and, and I'm full of both. I, I stand on the foundation of the Word of God, and I also have an active relationship where the Holy Spirit is leading me and transforming me, all right? So we also receive and interpret the Bible as our normative center of our rule of faith and practice. In other words, this is the foundation, right? The foundation is the Word of God, and then on that foundation, we allow the Holy Spirit to come and help us build and grow and learn and transform. But it's all built on the foundation of the Word. All right? I want to go back and look at that 2 Timothy passage one more time, but we're going to look at it in the message. There's nothing like the written Word of God for showing the way to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that, that could be its whole own sermon right there. 
all the instructions we need. You don't know the way? We, it can show you the way. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another. Like, it's all good. I like to say from the genealogy all the way to the map. Like, there's nothing in there that's wasted or unuseful. Showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion or those places where we've, we went against God's way, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task that God has for us. I don't know anybody in my personal relationships that is a believer of Jesus that doesn't have as a desire of their heart at some level, I want to be able to do the things that God asks me to do. I think that's like a baseline desire, but the problem comes when, well, how do I actually do them? How do I get equipped? How do I train myself? How do I get over my hurdles and my hang-ups and my hurts so that I can? Well, the word of Jesus is where we find that life-transforming reality that enables us to keep moving forward, to keep doing what Jesus is doing in partnership with him. You see, like I said a moment ago, the word of God is the foundation for righteous living and righteous relationships. Now, when we say righteous living, we're not talking about self-righteous. We're not talking about I become important because I kept more of the rules than you. We're talking about God's righteousness. The, the biblical word is imputed. Like it, it's, it's put on you. It's imputed to you. It's not something that you earn or curry by doing good acts, all right? But that is the foundation of me living my life in ongoing, growing, right relationship with Jesus and with other people, all right? Now, the reality is that in the process of following Jesus, accepting and embracing Jesus means accepting and embracing his word which also calls for action. Now, again, we can't get it backwards. We can't say that we have to do actions in order to embrace. God is not waiting for you to complete a checklist of religious activities before he will embrace you. He's ready to embrace you exactly right where you're at, in the mess that you're in, in, in whatever state you're in, whatever kind of relationships, none of that matters in relation to Jesus being willing to embrace you. And he's calling you to come and embrace him. Another way, an old pastor of mine used to say it, warts and all, like, you know, which is just a, sort of a metaphor for our hurts and our hang-ups, like the places where we're, we're a little rough around the edges. We're not perfect yet, right? But, but we, we can't get that backwards. Accepting Jesus means we embrace him, which means we embrace his word, which means then we try, with the Spirit's help, to do his word. We have to be doers of the word. And to begin to wrap this up and kind of bring it back home, the word, as we've been describing it, Jesus, brings knowing God, which is that relationship context, and doing God's will, which is the action. The words of Jesus, which are found here, but also in the way that he speaks to us through the scriptures and through a number of other ways, brings knowing God. Because again, what did Jesus say when they, he said to the disciples, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when we go to read the scripture, when we go to pray, when we go to worship, as we encounter Jesus' words, it enables relationship with him. It brings that reality, which also brings about the ability or the possibility of doing God's actions, of doing the things that he wants us to do. So you might be thinking, like I often have, I want to do that kind of stuff. Like nobody, <laughs> nobody wakes up in the morning uh, and looks at their family and says, I think I'm going to start a five-year plan today to become a drug addict and abandon my kids. 
right? But is that kind of reality present in society? Yeah. Because we have an enemy. We have one who seduces and deceives. And, and it affects our ability to walk that narrow path that we talked about last week. To, to move into the kingdom of God reality and walk the narrow way because that's only possible by the Spirit's help. So I know that was like, that's a really extreme example maybe from where we're at. But my point is, anything's possible in either direction. If we're not intentionally engaging the Word and, and being in relationship with God, then we're just taking baby steps away from God's purposes. And as that happens, things change. And we slowly lose the ability to do good. On the converse, the more we press into our relationship with God, and if you don't feel like you have a relationship with God, again, he's got his arms wide open. He's ready to embrace you. No matter what kind of mess you feel like your life is, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, no matter who you think you are, Jesus says, I know what you can do. I know what I paid for. And you can come just exactly like you are, and Jesus will embrace you, and you can embrace him back. He's not, he's not afraid of your mess. He's not afraid of getting dirty. If you feel like your mess is just like, your life is a mess, and you just feel like, I'm in the pits. I have done this wrong. I've done that wrong. I've, I've done that person wrong. I, I've, I've, whatever. And I can't possibly come to Jesus until I get myself a little more straightened up. Church, we should be a hospital for the sick. We're not a courtroom. We're not for judging people, because that's not the Jesus way. We're, we're, we're for everybody. And I, I got to be really honest with you. I kind of hope that over time, the people that are in this room look a little messier. Because it means that we're doing our job. As we have relationships with people that aren't as put together as we are. As we have relationships with people that like, I don't know about you, but like, I know people that like, it's obvious. They need Jesus. And they're never going to find him if my primary relationship to them is one of judgment, of one of trying to correct them when they're not on that path. But if I, like Jesus, can approach people with open arms, hey, I see you. I accept you just how you are, but I'm also inviting you. Would you like to come on this journey? Would you like, would you, and, and friends, sometimes we got to wait until they're ready for something different. But we can be there. We, the people of Jesus need to be the people that show up in the places where the darkness is. We can't stay in towers of light and expect everybody, come see what we've got. We've got the best show in town. Come, come, come. No, we have to go. One of the reasons historically that the church gathers is so that we can get encouraged equipped, and then we scatter. We go out. We go into all the different places where we live life and have influence and work and go to school because those are the places where there's not as much light. I mean, my, I, my hope is for most of you in the room this morning, it's like there's probably a lot of light if we're using that illustration. We need to carry that light into dark places. Can we just invite God right now as we begin to close this message to help us do that. Why don't you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I welcome you. And I, I encourage you just silently where you're at, just, just pray your own prayer of, of welcoming him to help you be the light to someone who's in the darkness. And that might bring up things of being thankful for how he's already embraced you. Maybe your life was or is a mess. And so let's just take this moment right now, and, and, and I can say this honestly, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that the mess that I am and was did not stop you from running and embracing me. 
thank you that you didn't withhold the full measure of your grace just because I wasn't quite put together right, just because I didn't fit the mold or didn't look like people said I should look. Thank you, Jesus, that you accept me as I am. Now, Jesus, would you help me, and those of us in this room that are opening our hearts to this reality, would you help us? Be that representation to somebody else. To be the kind of people that share our story. Without strings attached, without judgment or expectations, just share our story of, this is how good you were to me, Jesus. And I want to tell other people because there's power in that story. It demonstrates something of your kingdom reality. Real quick before I close, if you're here this morning and you're just like, I don't, I don't really know. I, I'm not sure I do have an actual relationship with Jesus. Would you be willing to stand and just stay right where you're at? All we're going to do is, is pray for you. But, but if you haven't established that or you're just not sure, but you're saying, but I want to be. If you're online, you can just click the button to raise your hand. But if you're here in the room, would you just stand? Just say, you know, I'm, I'm, I've not been sure, but I want to be. I want to I make that public step. I'm not going to put any pressure or linger on this like a long time, but I just, again, we want to regularly make that opportunity because my expectation, my prayer is that there will regularly be more people in the room who are moving towards that sort of thing. And we want to be the kind of people that make space for that. And that you don't have to be quite so buttoned up when you walk in the door. For the rest of us, just begin asking God, what is my next step? Where is it that I need to grow or learn or be equipped? And my strong, strong encouragement to you is, Share that with somebody and let them pray for you. Share it for accountability because sometimes we think, oh, yeah, I really should do this. And then that's where it ends. Share it with somebody who will gently encourage you. But also, at the end of the service, we'll make time to pray for each other. Come up and let somebody minister to you that God might equip you, give you the boldness, the strength, the courage to do the thing he's calling you to do. All right? Amen. Amen. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. We're going to start to transition. Worship team, you guys can go ahead and, and come up front. We have a special uh, treat today that we are going to actually celebrate a water baptism right here in our service. Uh, Devin, do you need to change or you're wearing, are you good? All right, I'll call you up in just a second. Um, so I'm going to have Devin come up and share here in just a second. Uh, but I just want to always just kind of make this statement, you know, water baptism does not save you. But it is a beautiful picture of the kingdom reality that someone is saying publicly, it's no longer me who's living, it's Jesus. I have surrendered to Jesus, I have turned my back on sin in the world, and I'm going to walk the Jesus way. And then what the picture of baptism symbolizes is showing, as I go under the water, it's representing that I have died with Christ. It's that, that same passage. No longer I who live. Like, I've been crucified with Christ. I have died with him. And then it would be sad if that's where it ended. Right? And I'm not one who holds people under till the bubbles stop. I don't. <laughs> I'm just. As we come back up, it represents, as we come out of that watery grave, we have become a new creature in Christ. There is not just like, all right, I got my card. You know, I can get in the gates when I get to the other side. No, I have a whole new life. Everything is different now. I'm a Jesus person. And Jesus is walking with me, and he's changing me, and he's transforming me. And, and things are going to be different from this point on, but not just because I'm going to try real hard. It's going to be different because Jesus is in me. Jesus is going to make the difference. We like using this hyphenated word here, the God difference. Because it's not just different like because I made a choice. It's 
altogether new transformative existence that's only possible by the grace of God. All right? So I'm going to have my friend Devin come up here, if you would, my brother. Let me grab this microphone. And I'm going to have him share just for a second. And let me go ahead and give, give instructions, too. Um, I've got the worship team ready. Once we get started, they'll, they'll lead us into time of worship, and that'll just seamlessly go right into worship. Come right up here, brother. So this is my friend Devin. I, I'm, I'm just going to say this for him. He's a little nervous. That's all right. We got it. Nobody's here to judge. So how long have you been following Jesus? Yeah. I think you said like seven or eight years maybe. Yeah. So what made you want to get baptized today? Yeah. Do you guys have this on? Okay. Could you guys hear him? No. Can you can you tell him again how yeah, show everybody what he's taking in Christ? Yeah. He wants to show everybody that he's taking in Christ. Like he's he's making it his. All right? So can we just take thirty seconds and just pray for him and then the next instructions are going to be if you're a, a family member or a friend or if you want to come up and be around the tank while we do the baptism, you can come up as soon as we pray. Um, feel free to take pictures. I'm going to set my iPad up just to uh, get a recording for you and your family to have. Um, but can we just take 30 seconds and pray? Father, I thank you for my friend Evan, my new brother, and I thank you for his relationship with Jesus. And I thank you that you are using this moment to demonstrate his new life that you really are changing things, that you're making all things new. And I thank you for his courage to stand up here in front of everybody and make the statement, Jesus is Lord. Just bless him now in this demonstration in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to let the team go ahead and start playing. Uh, hang out there for just a second. I'm going to go set this up real quick. And then if anybody wants to come up, go ahead and come up. Uh, I'm going to have him face this way, so go along either side. All right. I'm going to have you go ahead and step in. It's nice and warm. So sit on a stool facing that way. Yeah, it's pretty warm. It's pretty warm. You guys can come up close if you want. That's right. All right, so here's what I'm going to have you do. You put your hands like this across your chest. And then right when you're ready, you can reach up and hold your nose if you want. I'm going to put my hand right here, and I'm going to put a hand on your back. And I'm going to dunk you under and bring, bring you right back up. All right, so I'm going to ask you these questions again. So you've made that decision to turn away from the world and sin. Yes? And you're going to follow Jesus for your whole life. That's what you're saying today. All right? So, Devin, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are finishing up over here. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we are going to praise the Lord this morning. Stand with me. Are you guys ready? We're going to clap. We don't have our drummer today, so you guys are part of the band. Okay, you ready? You got your clappers ready? Let everything. Let everything. That has breath. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything. Let everything. That has breath. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley. Praise, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm down. Praise when I number, praise when surrounded. 
not worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. Again, we like to take time at the end of the service and pray for each other and offer you the opportunity for ministry. So if you're part of our ministry team, would you go ahead and make your way up to the sidewalls? 
I want to just share a few instructions, a few impressions and things. Uh, one, uh, my, my, the script in my head says, those of you who got baptized, but I just have the one guy today. So we would love to pray for you, Devin, if you wouldn't mind letting some of the ministry team just, we just want to bless your new life in Jesus and this important step that you took to make it, make it public. For the rest of us in the room, I would encourage you to come up for ministry prayer. Uh, for anything that you're dealing with, if the Lord has moved, if he's given you instruction, just really we'd love to pray with you regardless, but I think some specific things that he's highlighting. Uh, I want to just say one more time, if you do happen to be in the room and you've never taken that first step to say, I want to make Jesus my Lord, I want to have that relationship with him, and maybe you felt that when I called earlier, but you just didn't feel like you could stand up. That's okay. I want to offer that one more time. Come up and let some of these folks pray for you. Share what you're feeling. And uh, we would love to just help you take those first couple steps towards relationship with Jesus. Also, I want to kind of expand that out. Maybe you have that relationship, but I don't know. Maybe you feel like you've drifted or you've been you've been kind of off the path for a while and you've just not been sure how to get back. Uh, we would love to pray with you about that. God, uh, the thing I said about him uh, standing with open arms to embrace you, that's, that's, it's like the cell phone commercials. It's not just for new subscribers. It's for everybody. And so we many of us have been there. You walk the path, you know Jesus, and then somewhere along the way you, you drift off this way or that. And and there's a, there's a call, there's an invitation today. Jesus says, I've never turned my back. I'm still right here. My arms are still open. Yes, I know what you've done and how you feel about it, but it didn't change my love for you. It doesn't change my offer of embrace. And so if you just want to re-embrace Jesus, come up and let us pray for you and let us invite the Spirit to come and make that a reality, to give you the ability to do that that God is calling you to do. I also had a specific impression uh, about uh, some of you are, are weighing or, or specifically have felt stirred in this last hour or so to a specific call, whether that's uh, into some level of serving in some type of ministry, something, I, I don't, it, it's not that specific, but you have a clear sense, I'm supposed to move this direction, I feel called by the Lord to move this direction, and you can fill in the blank however the Lord's speaking to you, but we would love to pray and, and bless that and, and pray over you and help you take that important step. Because the truth is, he's always doing that. He's always calling. The, the Bible tells us that there's these fields, right, which represents our community and the need and those that, that don't yet experience hope. And he says that those fields, they're white, which is what happens when it's ready for harvest. He says, but the workers are few. And so Jesus is saying, I need more workers. I need more people to go into the fields, to use an old-timey phrase, the highways and the byways. Like, I need people who carry my name to go and gather the rest of my children, to harvest what is there in the community that needs Jesus. And so maybe you just feel stirred in that way and you'd like for us to pray that, well, what does that look like? How do I take practical steps towards that? All right, so can I just pray and invite the Spirit? And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a final chorus and you can go ahead and come up for prayer as we're singing, begin to share, begin to be ministered to. After we sing this final chorus, I'll come up and, and dismiss the service so that you're not captive but then you can hang out for prayer and ministry for a while because we don't want to rush what God is doing in your life. And, and I don't know how to state it more emphatically. God is doing some things in some people's lives in this room right now. And I'm just like, I'm excited about it. And I want to make space for it. And I want to just, can we just pray right now? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the way that you're moving on our hearts, the way that you're moving in the room. Thank you for the way that you've been present with us as we've, we've had so much to celebrate today. 
thank you for my friend Devin and, and what he represents in, in laying down his old life and stepping into the new. Thank you for those that are making decisions in their hearts, Jesus. But like all of us, sometimes we need your, your help to be courageous, to step out and actually try to do those things, to actually follow that call. So I'm asking right now, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that, that those things that you've been uh, dropping around different people's hearts in the congregation, that you would help those things just land right now, that, that we would be able to receive all that you have and that by your Holy Spirit, you really would transform us. You would transform us as individuals to be more like Jesus, and that you would transform us as a church, as a community, as a body, to be more like you, to be more about your work. Thank you, Jesus, for the ways you're already doing that. But we say, we say all together, more, Lord. And we say, come, Holy Spirit. Let's sing. You can go ahead and come up for, for ministry prayer, for any of the things I mentioned or otherwise, and then I'll come up and dismiss us in a minute, and then we'll, we'll continue praying after that, but you'll be dismissed. Lord, we just continue to thank you again for everything that you're doing, everything that you are. And we're asking now, Jesus, that you would take anything we've received in these last few moments and that you would help us carry it into the week and into the places that we go. May we carry the spirit of Jesus and the atmosphere of heaven in every place that we go. Would you enable us to be world changers? room changers, life changers with your help, with your partnership. I bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. You're going to be dismissed. Uh, I forgot to say this. If you're part of Devin's family and close friends, if you guys would meet me up here, I just want to take a picture and give you your certificate. Um, I'd also encourage you to uh, come by and, and give a hug or a word of encouragement uh, to our new friend, Devin. And... Uh, yeah, continue to come up for prayer as you feel led. Otherwise, you are dismissed. Online friends, we'll see you next time. Uh...